Hi everyone, I'm Mary, and today we're going to be looking more Tex Talks Battle Tech, specifically the Warhammer. Now, last time around we got to me having to quit because literally the sheer incompetence displayed in that Star League Destroyer was physically painful in ways I was not expecting. And text ended the last segment by going, and that's just how incompetent the design was. Now we get to see how horrible it is in practice. And I'm just sitting here going, I didn't realize this would hurt me. But it does. So, subjecting myself to it again. I know the Warhammer's coming from this somehow, but we're not there yet, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> If you haven't already, there's a link below to the original video. It's Tex. You know he's good. Hit him up. Now you're done, don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and tell me what I'm missing. Because I need something good to counteract all of the incompetence. Which is crazy, because when you really think about it, it's institutional incompetence that they're writing about accurately. So it's fictional incompetence, which is actually competence in writing. But I'm not going to think about it too hard, because that way lies madness. While I am already mad, I don't think I need to make it worse than I already is. Even though it's already too late for me. Let's get started. So, some years later, the now quasi-operational Baron class was brought into the Star League Defense Forces with now corrected engines that vastly diminished its ability to maneuver, accelerate, and hold combat speed. I need you to understand why- Wait, it took what was already there. Oh, but corrected revisions. It's not so much that it was made worse, it's that they could never make it better than they thought it would be, and it was just slower- not able to get to the speeds it could slower achieve. It just doesn't... So it's a smaller... No, it's not even smaller. It's just weaker in general? Sorry, I just hear Destroyer and Slow and I'm thinking, that sounds like a bad idea. Oh no. Why that is a problem. One moment. Let me check the dictionary here. Dictionary? Uh, huh. Merriam-Webster's 2831. A good enough dictionary for people who could read. That's basically what their entire tagline should be regardless. Let's see. Uh, destroyer. Noun. Definition of destroyer. One that destroys. Mm, I can agree with that. Small and fast. Two, a small fast warship used especially to support larger vessels. Okay. So the SLDF had a warship. A destroyer, which by definition was a small, fast warship used especially to support larger vessels. A destroyer that was big, slow, and couldn't keep pace with friendly fleets or chase anything. It was so. So it was so slow it couldn't even keep pace with its own fleets. I mean, I knew it was slow because he said I didn't know how slow because he didn't said I just. It is so slow that it couldn't keep pace with its own. So basically. You made a discount warship that can't jump, that's slower than warships, and is somehow more expensive in sheer cost to value comparisons? And for all I know, maybe straight up value too. Oh, oh my. I know I should take a second to keep reflecting that this is incompetence written into a story to show that there are good and bad points to a setting, which is important because if everything's good, it just becomes a giant pile of, oh, and there is another improvement on the already amazing thing that did any improvements, but now it is inferior because it was improved upon. As opposed to here where it's like, yeah, there are issues, but it's just, it's too well written. It looks too real, man. Supposed to. As it's like the uncanny valley of incompetence. 1.6 billion sea bills per unit. And that's before we engineering the damn things to actually work. And not even work as designed. And I forgot it was 6 billion sea bells per unit. And it's funny when you consider people have told me that actual warships on Earth cost maybe four to five times that. Which considering sea bill transitions are four to five times... Reduced, so one is worth five. This destroyer costs as much as maybe one warship on Earth. And I'm just sitting here thinking, these numbers hurt. They, they really, really, they, they cause pain in ways I didn't realize. Ow. And they made these. In fact, 
they mass produced them. I do like this. The so mass produced because of the cost or political sensitivity. How many did they make? Rather than admit they were useless and use the sad state of the destroyer fleet as a basis for building something better with coalition support, the brand new SLDF instead smiled, nodded, and said thank you before immediately parceling them out to the successor states as a goodwill measure. So in other words, I just, ah. that is brilliant in its dickishness and also absolutely catastrophic in its dickishness. So they made a mass produced fleet of overcost of warships. And I'm going to ignore the part where they probably accurate to what earth warships cost. Maybe not for the comparative size, but just for a ship in very general sense. But then, then they took this and poison gifted it to everyone else who isn't them. It, it's horrible because everyone who gets this gift is like, oh, <laughs> die. But then they're going, hey, it'd be a real shame if you indicated you had hostilities by not accepting our gift. Take it. It's lovely. You should make it the counterpoint of your entire fleet. It literally weakens their allies, who we definitely know would never do anything horrible or like completely abandon them. But also it leads to the point where like, yeah, maybe we should completely abandon them in the future because they dicked us over with these things. I just, it makes a lot more sense knowing that they had this kind of relationship of power dynamics. And now, oh, hey, will you look at that. They just ran out of their destroyer fleet. Huh, I guess they need to get a new one unless they bought another one after this. If they buy, if the Star League gets a second round of these pieces of junk, that's on them. The first round being given to erstwhile allies to make sure that they really need the Star League because the better things are not going to be used anymore. No, that, that would just, uh The hesitancy to throw out the Star League versus the entire, hey, maybe let's just say fuck it and take it ourselves. It makes a lot more sense now. Oh, sure. They kept some of the hegemony to remind people that, yes, ships exist. Your government is keeping some. you safe. But the bulk of them went to the successor states who wanted some freebies for joining up. Well, they got free. Yes. I know they're not called successor states yet, but that's what we call them today. And I'd rather not get into that just yet. Competitors. Which I'm very sure the successor states were happy to get. Hand me downs from the hegemony were prized assets. Seriously? At least until that point. It is my opinion that yes, a worship can be so bad when it's free that it permanently sours relationships and makes client states wonder why they ever bought into a Star League in the first place. Yeah. Whether or not this is a pre Ameris domino or cause for the Star League to be undermined from the very beginning by bad faith actions under the guise of charitable donations to client states is perhaps a fuller discussion for another time. Oh. Oh, that's... For as much as this is now an absolute pile of what? I'm going to say even just that hint that he's dropping in there's like yeah you know how Mars played the game he wasn't the first one the entire idea of this being a goodwill mission for Amaris in the sense that he looks better by not f YouTube now doesn't like swearing doesn't do the poison gift that the Star League does it does I mean I thought it would already help his thing ent entirely but no it seems like it it seems like Texas hinting at this might actually be a plan from Mars's ancestor. Oh, oh, that's actually really cool. I wish we could get more of that. Just like to see how the dominoes pre Amaris were set up. I would love that just because I love this entire time frame of BattleTech. It's so freaking cool. But I will say this if they were that embarrassingly bad and effectively obsolete by production, that they were shuffled off as door prizes and political favors. Were they really all that terrible in the grand scheme of things? Yes. I mean, after all, how bad could it be? Oh, no. Well, as it turns out, no. the answer to that is pretty fucking bad. 
and this next part of the story is pretty fucking great. What? So, a weapon that cost 1.6 billion sea bills ran blindly into services because someone a generation ago. Oh, it was 1.6 billion? I thought it was 6 billion. I mean, it's still a lot, but also. Go thought it was a good enough idea to go all in on them, now in the hands of a navy who was adamant they would make do with what they had. Surely, this would not be a disaster, right? Considering the universe we currently live in, I think you know the answer. Oh no. Now, as this is academics, I must prove my points and begin to tie all this together into why we don't, or more accurately, shouldn't do these things. And for this example, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite underdogs who, time and again, typically reminds nations in short order that just because you have an army doesn't mean you should use it. Why do I want to say that this is something to do with Comstar? I know it's not Comstar. It can't be Comstar. Comstar doesn't exist in this time frame yet. But for some reason, every time it's like, the underdogs who always show that just because you have it, you shouldn't use it. I'm like, I keep thinking took head, but at the same time, it's not that. I know it's not that. Unless he is actually going to use it. I really doubt it, though. Also, because they literally had an army, and that would defeat the entire point. A I nation mind that measures go away by the Megaton. A nation that thinks recoil is a repetitive sports injury. What? And that the difference between mine clearing equipment and infantry clearing equipment depends entirely on who's driving and in what direction. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. This is a story about the Torian Concordat. By the late 2570s, the Barons were still in service. Barons? Oh, the ship, yeah. I'm assuming these are the parts of the Barons that the Torians tore apart? My assumption. They were on frontline duty with generation after generation of expensive upgrades, fixes, and standard operating procedures created and made to correct as many of its defects as possible. And this isn't unreasonable, for these things had cost a lot of goddamn money, and they had to be paid off. And as governments will run... Oh, they weren't even fully funded? They were... There comes a point where you're just going to say, screw you guys, I'm going home. And they they still kept paying for these. I thought they were just writing them off entirely, but no, apparently not. Hopefully it's Lau who's about to get their butt kicked with them. Any acquired asset until it's no longer serviceable. This is not at all an unexpected outcome. Unfortunately for the Baron, its supporters past and present were going to have their moment in the sun or at least a federated one what? the 2570s are interesting to note as the relatively new star league was trying to bully the periphery into joining up coercing them into becoming star league territories yeah <laughs> coercing also known as we're going to invade because they did do that to a lot of the periphery states I think all of them, that actually. Meant the periphery states could look forward to new and exciting forms of unwarranted solicitation, taxation without any sort of meaningful representation, and repression from a distant and uncaring government. It also meant the wonderful opportunity of joining teams with a government they fundamentally didn't understand, care for, or even notionally support. Wait, what? Understandably, most periphery nations said no thank you. Or in the case of Van Zandt, what in the cinnamon toast fuck is a Star League? <laughs> oh, the cinnamon toast. <laughs> they don't even know what the Star League is. Van Zandt, it's like Alabama. If Alabama was somehow even more dangerous. <laughs> oh. As it turns out, people who had gone that far out into space did so for. One eye because it is a laser eye. Is that a hunchback? Oh, that is weird. And it, it literally has... Honestly, I thought this was a 40k design in the first place. I saw the skulls on the head and... Are those just like decoratively large skulls? Yeah, they have to be because people are not... Unless this is the really small art. No, no, there's the people in the background. Even at a distance, they would be way too small. So someone mocked up huge skulls to put on this mech's head. I'm just going to assume that this is one of those cases where the artist took all thought and went, eh, don't care. Doing it anyways because it's fun. And it's like, scale? What scale? It looks cool. 
Is that a hatchet then? Because it has the axe and an underslung Captain Blood Cannon. It's Dr. Hook. Are these literally pirate games? I don't... Oh my god. Pirates, man. For a reason. Mostly, they were dissatisfied with things in the inner sphere, or at least the core worlds of humanity. Mm, that does not look like a hatchet. Generation man. after generation, they had boarded their ships, kicked their heels free of Terra, and embarked to a new life, far from any comforts or notion of so-called civilization. These people were, by then, no longer Terrans. They did not think fondly of where they were from. They did not look back and measured their success against the core worlds of humanity. They made their own path and were set to defend it. They didn't want anything to do with the Terran government, its successors or the states they birthed, and they had gone far out of everyone's way to do just that. And like most folks who were keen on keeping on what they'd made for themselves, the Torians had founded a competent military That's for the purposes say, of keeping assholes off their lawn. <laughs> this military trained and drilled hard, realizing that sovereignty on the ass end of the space was only guaranteed by their will, hard work, sacrifice, and if necessary, their own blood. Not to mention eventually just moving further out away so you can be expanding in ways that they just don't want to bother taking. Which takes forever, but is actually a very viable way to say, hey, you can get here, but it's just way too annoying. It is entirely a good defensive strategy and one of the reasons America has been invaded less, because oceans are annoying. Yeah, that is actually a very good reason. When they realized the start Sounds stupid, was but it works. Going to politely back Hell, even down, rivers do that. They prepared accordingly. They didn't beg, they didn't really negotiate. They dug in, put their helmets on, and waited. Is that a little bike helmet? When the Star League said this was for the benefit of all, the Torians replied with the diplomatic version of, no thank you. <laughs> okay, I recognize that as a Black Knight. I know I've seen this mech before and people have told me about it, but I don't remember it. And this one, I do not remember this one, and I know I've seen this picture before, and I cannot place it because it has that weird saucer background where the torso is more forward than not. It's like someone took a reverse king crab. And when they saw then gave it bigger forces arms and legs. marshalling on their frontier, they opened and their there's an book and went to work. Case Amber, as it was called, was Ooh. the first time the SLDF really had to fight a nation that wasn't nominally or supposed to be under its control. Because they had the issue Whereas with the... This was a People conflict in against a periphery state that was plainly tired of their shit and prepared to do something about it. Oh? The SLDF assumed their navy and their military was of higher quality. Oh. Oh, no. I was under the assumption that the SLDF realized that their destroyers were shit. Are they not aware of that? They assumed her claw. That's. There's actually a very good precedent for this. It's literally any imperial power when they've gone up against someone in what they consider a new world. It's like, you should listen to us because we have better guns than you, followed by anyone else going, ha ha ha. No. It doesn't always go that way, but it actually has. So there's precedence. And as an American, I'm thinking of one in particular. And should that fail, the substantial numbers advantage would make the war a decided outcome. And so, I need to illustrate a difference in naval doctrine. The SLDF Navy was based on the Hegemony Navy, which at the time favored advanced technologies, complicated designs, and innovative building practices, all in an attempt to keep power... Oh... Ah, see, for the SODF versus the hegemony, that, that's very... For the hegemony, it makes sense. They don't have a lot of land to cover. They don't have a lot of people to draw from. They don't have a lot of resources to draw from, so they better have the best of everything. But if they're doing the entire SODF for the entire inner sphere, and they were still trying to go the hyper-specialized, hyper-advanced route that doesn't have easily replaceable kind of uniform items... Replaceability and ease of access are very much important things if you're trying to standardize everything. 
If every sing- it's like the difference between everyone driving a Ferrari and there's no mechanics around versus everyone driving a Honda and there's no mechanics around. You're not going to figure out how to fix a Ferrari, but you might be able to slap down something for a Honda and go, eh, it works, fine, cool. And it's possible. I wouldn't trust anything I've fixed that way, but I think I could probably do it at a pinch and with a lot of luck. If I'm touching a Ferrari, I'm assuming something's going to blow up. Might not even be the car. It might just be like randomly my hand will spontaneously combust. It would be crazy and blood everywhere. But yeah, I would see that happening more likely than actually fixing it. Parity with the surrounding states. Those states had since become allies, if at least notionally. Okay, I'm glad he had the notionally thing because <laughs> Kirita allies are Lao allies. <laughs> That's funny. As uh. such, the SLDF Navy inheriting these vessels found themselves with a navy that was fantastic on paper and yet completely untested if you blink wrong it breaks things ever fucking matter actual war if it takes damage war everything breaks had not fought in a very long time to the fullest of their ability to do so because of the Ares conventions and yes while the Ares conventions were now suspended under the Star League charter their impact on the intervening years of conflict was imprinted clearly on their doctrines, shipbuilding, warfighting, and battle theory. Which, I should point out, these were conventions that the Torians had never signed. These oh, were yeah. conventions the Torians had never observed and didn't trust. Mainly because, shortly after the Capellans signed the treaty, they gassed the Torians. And, as it turns out, most people tend not to forget shit like that. And they really shouldn't. Also, it's kind of weird how much of a role these guys were probably playing in, and I can't believe I'm saying this. Saving the Star League? No, no, hear me out on this one. They're kicking in the teeth of the Star League now, and it's probably one of the only reasons they will, I'm assuming, get their act together and make it so they can actually do crap later on, such as Kerensky having people who are competent and weapons that are good underneath him. Yeah, if they hadn't kicked their teeth in now, it probably would have been a lot weaker when Amaris did his coup, and they might have had to dig in less to achieve more because they just wouldn't have had as many competent designs to go against. The military production might not have been there. I am wondering if someone could pull a correlation between this. It's all fiction, so for all I know, it could be unrelated and just happened in a vacuum, but usually this is a very competently written system. I know at least as far as the earlier systems. I don't know much about anything beyond the clan invasion. I know the jihad happened, and while I like some of the overall story beats, I've heard the stories themselves are kind of... a thing. And everything after that is a thing, and one of the writers apparently grew to hate his own character and couldn't wait to kill him off, but wasn't allowed to due to contractual obligations. Yeah, it's depressing to think about. And the Torians, well, this is their symbol. And such is Mess their with the symbol, bowl. because we have trained since our founding. So I've been meaning to ask this. I know it's supposed to be a bull, but why does it wear strap-on horns? Like, I'm not the only one seeing that, right? It's literally a bull, or like a really fancy pig with a ring in the nose. But then the horns look like they're literally stapled on. I'm not the only one seeing that, right? day to stack bodies like fucking cordwood so if you insist in fucking around you will most certainly find out doesn't fit on the money and probably sends the wrong message to international investors the Torian navy was designed by people who are making do with less hell-bent on keeping scary strangers out of their backyard pretty <sighs> I love spaceship designs. They're so freaking cool. I mean, you can see all the rows of guns, the front mounting launchers, the heavier ones. It looks two to each side. They might be lasers. They might be giant ass naval PPCs. They could just be missile launchers for all I know. I'm assuming these might be lasers just because they can swivel around and rockets over here. And then you have this, which almost looks like a rotating hab block for artificial gravity, as opposed to the spheres and the dropships that just power forward, which is interesting because... They seem to be oriented up and down as opposed to that. Huh. Actually, when you have the giant engines in the back, it would be weird if you did build them in the standard layered structure going down rather than backwards. Huh. Eh, I'm going to ignore it because it looks cool. 
It was a frigate navy mostly, favoring speed and firepower to get the job done. So they're fast and they hit hard, as opposed to the entire round of destroyers the SODF have, which are slow and ungunned by comparison to what they thought they would have. And they're slow. Have I mentioned they're slow and they don't turn fast? And this is literally just going to be a giant case of, hey, check it out. If I go and stand behind him, he can't hit me. It's an Elden Ring mini boss that doesn't actually have any skill requirement. It was just a damage check. Oh my God. Or run and alert everyone else if it couldn't. The SLDF Navy at that time was the Grand Fleet designed to look good and provide a strategic feel-good measure to theater-scale conflict. It was built on the principle that it would never be needed, and therefore only needed to match the latest idealized version of what a fleet was, with every new generation of leadership and appropriations. The Torian Navy was no such thing. It didn't live in military academies or in advertisements about next-gen anything. It had one objective, to defend the Torian nation, and was principally designed to fight the SLDF and anyone else who got ideas on free real estate. To illustrate this, let's look at how the Torians built their standard worship of the conflict. Ooh. This is the Concordat. It really, they actually call it the Concordat? I'm... I, of course they named their warship after their actual... The Torian Concordat, and they actually called this is like calling a a cruiser in America, not a cruiser, a would be better to go battleship or a carrier, as a carrier, the America. Actually, I'm going to be completely honest. If I didn't know the president was president names, I would be very surprised if there wasn't an America cruiser or America battleship or the America carrier, like just something out there that just had the name. I'm actually surprised we haven't done that. Also, they have the tonnage for the frigate. It's just a frigate, too. Oh, Ooh, standard. Max thrust, three Gs. Oh, wow. For something that big, that's actually impressive. Three to seven plus 15 passengers. Not least specific, but okay. Fuel, I'm assuming that's a lot. Heat sinks. Ooh, armaments. 15 naval cannons, three NLS. Those are nukes. 16 large lasers and 32 medium lasers. Four and 32 LRM 15s. Okay, I'm going to be asking the obvious question here. I get the things here. I get even large lasers because lasers. Medium lasers? I thought their effective range was decent in a mech, but if you're talking spatial distances, that's literally like saying knife fighting distance in the fact that ramming might actually be a possibility at that distance. They're not actually going to ram them, are they? You know, I can't say that's not an option. Maybe they're actually going to ram them. It's a big frigate. It can sustain twice the acceleration of the Baron. It carries 500 tons of armor that is not fancy and simply very hard. It is designed for easy damage control, easy field refits, even in lower technology. Ooh, easy field refits and control. Damage control is important because if you lose the ship, you don't get to fix it until much later and you're just salvaging scrap at that point. So... It doesn't really go bad easily, and you can fix it easily, and it goes faster than the enemy. This is just a giant pile of this works. I like this. ...based facilities and can operate independently of other vessels for extended periods of time. Oh, it's independent. It boasts overlapping fields of fire, ranging from mech-scale lasers and LRMs to a full complement of naval-scale lasers and autocannons. Yeah. In many ways, it actually outguns the Baron. Functionally, the Concordat Frigate is an anti-everything cocaine-fueled death machine designed to speed into action wherever the- It's literally Space Texas, I get that, yeah. Uh, the fact, though, if they can just get behind and stay behind the Baron, which it sounds like they're very much going to be able to do, it doesn't matter if it outguns it or not, because if you can't shoot them, you can't shoot them. And never being able to get within range and just getting picked off at long range would work. Or if I'm assuming they're going to get really close right behind and say, nope, done, gone. 
the Torians needed most, and to be multi-mission capable as an orbital bombardment platform, troop transport, strategic weapons platform, and to be honest, Jack of all there was trades. nothing better than the Concordat class frigate for skirmishing with pirates. And in this sad case, these pirates looked an awful lot like the SLDF and their new friends. So the Torians made a multi-mission capable heavy frigate that's faster, better, more reliable, robust, and deadly than its larger state opponent. Naturally, this solution has to cost a fortune. But... With the Torians having a fraction of their industrial base. Actually, it didn't. What? First reason being is it wasn't sophisticated at all. It was just good engineering and off-the-shelf components. That and I heavily suspect the Torians punish incompetent people making decisions at a strategic procurement level with actual... <laughs> so instead of having literal generations of, this looks good, I'm gonna do it. I mean, sure, I had to fire all the people who were cleaning the bathrooms, but money! Bring your own toilet paper. It's that level of decision making on the one side with the SLDF, and the other one's like, no, that's stupid. Stop. prison sentences instead of allowing them to meddle in affairs and so institutional incompetence needed, versus actually doing your job desired by listening to people who fight actual fucking wars instead of listening to self-actualization concepts floated by war planners who don't fight and never will by correctly identifying what they required to defend the realm instead of opting for the biggest the best and the most expensive solution the Torian Navy beat the S. I just realized they all have the Torian symbol pointing up on their belts. Because if it was going the other way, every time they sat down, they would just stab themselves in the crotch. <laughs> I was like, wait, why is it going? Oh. I thought for a second this was from Star Wars because it was all going. It's like, is that the Republic? No. Oh my God. It is weird, though, how you can tell this is a projection because it's cutting out here and it's all perfectly square around it. Neat little way to detail that. SLDF to deployment of its peer vessel by two decades, two full decades of use, training, education, tactic development, and establishing an actual operational readiness rate oh, someone's before smiling. the Baron left That's the weird. slip yard. Also, the Concordat's engines worked the first time they did a shakedown cruise, because instead of trying to rewrite the book, they took what worked and accepted it as good enough. Amazing concept, right? Victorian naval doctrine centered around these now very proven ships. They weren't just another line item in the budget. The Torian Navy made a recommendation for shipbuilding. The shipbuilders built it, and then they used them. It was a ship designed for a purpose, and put into that purpose as reasonably as any periphery nation could. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm always on the side of trying to do something new and crazy. But not to build an entire mass-produced fleet with that new and crazy thing. I'm sorry, that's still such an incredibly incompetent idea. It's like, if you built one, and it was a prototype, you saw what worked, and you know, refined it, and then when they were done, it's like, okay, we get this. Now we're going to mass-produce. That's fine. That's actually really smart. I am sorry, I just keep coming back to the Torrents. While they're not advancing anything here, their shit works. And the entire time... The SODF is going, we have the most sophisticated technology that we don't even know if it works yet because it is so new, no one knows. <laughs> I mean, they're going full leering in sheer idiocy in charge. Also, considering the SODF drives from anyone, just going to throw it out there. While it might be designed around the hegemony's self-defense force, we know who probably bought the commission to make a lot of decisions. And so the tiny Torian Navy stood off against the fleets of the SLDF and House Davion allies in what would be one of the greatest defense in depth campaigns in history. How much was a wave accounting for? I don't actually know. Also, dude, they're actually... Every time Tex does another episode, the level of animation they put in, in the various images and the art they use has gone up bit by bit. At first, they're just static images, and they still use them. And then it's like images that have moving components and alternate layers. And I always freak out because they're beautifully drawn. And they get it across. And here, we're just looking at a battle. We're going back and forth. We see the layers just moving. And the ship's slowly closing in. So there's multiple layers of that. There's the great background in the back where we see the expanse of a planet. So it's close enough to see that. But it also gives us something other than an empty background of space. And gives size comparison and size depths with the various ships in there. And 
Oh, there's even the battle damage added to the art. I just, this is so freaking cool. And there's the alternate piece right here where it's being blown off. Oh, dude. Sorry, space battles are my thing. And this is literally just sheer, oh, yes, right now. <laughs> Not 10 battles, 10 waves. That is to say, landing troops and then getting stalled and then sending for help oh. and hoping the Torians don't show up to murder them as well. Oh, that's an entire Even laser battery the there. war slowly turned against them, the Torian military time and again kept the bulk of the SLDF, its self-drawing reinforcements, to barely hold on to their conquests. Up? And it kept them on shaky footing for the duration of the entire war. Dude, we see the pilot and the space gear and the helmet and then the ship literally blowing up! Oh. <laughs> the Torian Navy made things dicey through asymmetrical warfare, hit and run naval raids, and clandestine resupply of blockaded worlds through an excellent fleet and good naval warfare doctrine. Not to mention ships that actually worked. This allowed the state to fight the Star League for so long it became an embarrassment and potentially another crisis of government. Yep. Conquering the Torian Concordat took the SLDF from 2576 to 2596. 20 years. 20 fucking years of fighting the Torians on both land and sea and across the vast gulf of stars. 20 years because they had to chase a navy around with absolutely inferior ships they had no choice to use because they were bought and paid for by war planners now likely dead, retired, or too busy counting oceans of money to fucking care. Gotta love institutional incompetence. It's like corruption, but unfortunately legal. <laughs> I am very curious how this leads to the Warhammer, though. If anything, it seems like it would lead to a VTOL or something that would be land, air, sea, space capable, which... I know technically still exist, but they're weird because some of them are unseen units. 20 years with the fear that every time the SLDF moved an inch, the Torian Navy would show up, drop off troops, and lay out another thousand megatons or so of go the fuck home. Yep. So why bring up the Baron, military affairs, military procurement, strategic planning, the reunification war and the divide between an idealized military and the one you operate on a daily basis in a discussion on the Warhammer. Well, for one, I think this is clearly established by now, the customer has no idea what the fuck they want. Yes, yes, that is very much true. And not even just in military procurement or warships or arms, any time. If you go in there saying, this is exactly what I want, you're either paying up front and the person's going like, sucker. Or they're going, oh god, we got one of these guys. It doesn't really change. Ugh, you can say that almost anywhere, too. And the builder is fine with that, so long as the bills are paid on time. Things like the mullet, jorts, shoulder-fired, contact-fused nuclear weapons. Oh, yeah. I heard about this. This is stupid. Although I will say, um, as far as the mullet goes, like the mullet. it's stupid, but God damn, it's Richard Dean Anderson, man. He's the one guy I know who could actually pull it off. Everyone else looks stupid. Freaking MacGyver. George, shoulder That's fired, bad. That's also bad. Used nuclear weapons, tetraethyl lead, chlorine trifluoride, spray on hair, Agent Orange. D wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I've heard about Agent Orange. DDT is good for me. Spray on hair was a real thing? I thought that was a joke. It just is spray paint, isn't it? Or is it just foaming spray paint? It's like, see, it's hair. I don't. I, you know what? There's sometimes where I'm just going to pretend this is a joke. I know it's not, but I'm going to pretend it is because this, out of everything he said, is the dumbest thing I can imagine. Although I'll stand by the mullet just because he chose Richard Dean Anderson's picture. Anyone else, I would agree with him completely. Agent Orange, DDT, and certain automotive products do not exist by accident. Ah, yes, this thing. How the hell are these still on the road? 
It's like, I want a car, but also I want something that makes me say, huh, I need less money. Uh, I hate these things on their own. I've never seen someone drive it who isn't someone. I'm like, <laughs> please drive into a ditch. People, meaning the customer, absolutely ask for these things. And typically, they know not what they ask for. Yeah. Nor care what happens afterward. And in Especially this case, wallet. when the customer is a government official and a government procurement official at that, and the amount of money is essentially infinity, Bad decisions and their impact can be measured in lives, borders, and flags. Wrong choices in these cases can be the end of a nation, and quite messily so. Seriously, how did the Lyrans even survive? Also, what was that picture in there for a second? Quite messily so, and there's a, a small flash of a picture. Wrong choices in these cases can be the end of a nation, and quite messily so. Tex, what did you just sneak in there? there? There was something in there. Is that an editing mistake? Or did you just... What did you do, Tex? And quite messily so. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh. God, I, I'm having trouble getting In this these one. these cases can be the end of a nation. And quite messily so. Okay, it didn't come up yet. I'm just going to go frame by frame here. This is taking a long time, but I want to see what he just snuck in there. These things. The littoral combat ships, where it's like, uh, I've, I only heard about these because people in the last video were like, hey, yeah, these things were a giant piece of, uh, I would say excrement, but let's be honest, excrement serves a purpose in fertilizer, and that would be a detriment to excrement at that point, so we're not going to say that. I don't know why I use that accent. I'm just assuming that's everyone's accent when they comment. It's a, uh, kind of something that's assumed. I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. And since I've never met anyone in person, I'm going to assume I'm right as well. Uh, it looks cool, but also... Very stupid. So thanks to poor choices, you now have a $1.6 billion turd in something like the Baron, which again is... Also, the Turians now have an example of all those crazy technologies packed in that they don't, don't work, but they can take all the free stuff from in it's salvage. $1.6 billion per hull at the point you lay the keel and many times over again for fixes, upgrade, repair, modifications, and maintenance. By refusing to acknowledge poor choices over successive generations and careful modification of mission scope, you make a mistake like the Baron for future generations to curse. And then, sadly, to die for. The Baron and the Reunification War did more to close the chapter fully on the Worship Age than anything else in my own humble opinion. Which is an interesting take, because if that was a very competent vehicle, if it as a Worship was better and less experimental and or they just experimented with one and fixed it what would the worship age look like if that was still going on i think i asked in the last one if there's alternate universe takes the catalyst is doing where they have this i'm only asking because they got an alternate universe where kerensky didn't leave the inner sphere and it is somehow more brutal but also more hopeful than regular battletech timeline i'm wondering if there is one where they do that where it's like hey here's the one where it's still warships because they never screwed around with the Baron. I would love to see that just because I love warships. No idea how to play them. And I probably wouldn't enjoy the game nearly as much as I do with mechs. Because when you get into space and distances and heights and three-dimensional. Until we get actual really good representations to physically go up and down. It just doesn't seem as fun to me as using a marker to say how high you are. But that would be cool just to hear about that setting. And I would like that because spaceships, man. <laughs> is it a good reason? Yes. Yes, I think it is actually. Bad weapons are doubly cursed when their chief design assumption is that there will never be an actual test of their intended purpose by a peer military power. Cough, cough, Russia! <clears throat> cough, cough. Sorry, I had something on my throat. I meant to say, ha, the Russian army. The Baron stood as a reminder that if you bought something bad and continued to excuse how awful it was by pouring all the money in the world into it, you might just get embarrassed generations later by a non-peer military force that knows what they're doing. And that's why you have the age of the battle mech. 
Battle mechs are a far cheaper bet, requiring far fewer resources, and if, heaven forbid, you end up with a turd, you can quietly make it go away in years instead of decades upon decades of refit and refurbishment and replacement. Although they literally still did that with the Blackjack and a lot of other mechs because they were a lot of turds, but then they made them work over time because, I mean, everything else was so bad by comparison, the turd looks amazing. Basement required for most naval programs. To most, it was clear that warships had had their moment and when needed, couldn't change the fact that war needs somebody to go down to the planet and beat people to death until the flags change. And so mechs became very attractive as investments for future conflict. Additionally, all that cash that went into naval building programs were now starting to pour into anything other than ships you can't use, or in the case of the Baron, fucking shouldn't. These virtually unlimited defense funds were scooped up by the brand new mech industry, which said, hey, we're cheap. The ultimate lesson in the Baron, Naval procurement and its impact on mech design is thus. You can put all the money in the world into something that is supposed to be innovative and world-changing, but it is sometimes far wiser to make something good enough and leave it well the fuck alone. Like the Concordan, the Warhammer was conceived and produced all the while the Baron was still having its teething troubles. And so oh, so this was done at the same time period. And this is what's going to take advantage in the sudden available money from the Baron project finally dying, huh? And refocusing because of that. Oh. Also, this is an old one because it looks janky. Like, it almost doesn't look like there's the fibers in here, the Mylar? Minar? I knew the name, but I forget easily. Certainly it's very much an industrial design. From it, even though it was a mech and certainly not anywhere near as expensive as a vast ship production program. Military procurement programs, regardless of intended use, were shaped by disasters like the Baron. And if not the Baron, any number of follies committed in the name of state security from the then recent past. In the military industrial complex world, lessons like the Baron were a dime a dozen. And while perhaps one of the most prominent, cases like the Baron were on the cheap end of fucked up decision making. That, that's on the cheap end? You know what? I'm actually afraid to ask this one because I might get an answer. But, screw it, I'm going to ask. If this was the cheap mistake at this period, what was the expensive one? And I know for the first person who says Nicholas Kerensky not being aborted. Yes, technically correct, but not in this time period because this is well before that, I think. <sighs> yeah, let me know because I'm very curious and or terrified to find out. Okay, so I know how far my sense of can be stretched. And finding out that the Baron, with all of this, was not the most expensive mistake they made. That's where my extent of woo stops any further. And I'll be like, nope, nope. Information overload. No more compute. Yeah. So I'm going to cut it there. Again, if anyone knows the answer to my last question, let me know because I'm curious and also terrified. It's, it's probably going to be bad. I realize that. But I also kind of want to know because I just like this time period in Battletech more than anything else at this point because there's starships still, man. That's literally my favorite thing ever. <laughs> I love giant stompy mechs. And I also love giant starships. The few times you have giant stoppy mechs that are also starships, I'm just sitting here going like, ah. it does actually happen sometimes. Not often, but sometimes. So yeah, if you haven't already, there's a link below to the original video from text. Hit it up and let me know whatever I missed because I'm pretty sure there is. And last time around, I didn't know about the littoral ship. I don't know a lot of the details there still, but people just know a lot about what's going on. And it's really cool to find out. So in advance for everyone who did say that, thanks. Oh, this wouldn't be so much advanced as after the fact. But details, words, I do them occasionally. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.